of this week's program. We're going to have a look at the debate about whether steel versus lead when it comes to duck shooting. But most importantly, we're going to find out what bureaucratic moves will stop you farming. You'll have to put a padlock on the gates. But in just a moment or two, it's animal health, prevention and cure. Sheep measles, what is it? Yeah, so we touched a wee bit on it uh, in one of the prior segments and I thought we'd go into a little bit more depth. So sheep measles is a parasitic disease. Um, its main problem um, is its result in excessive loss of, of meat from a carcass through trimming. So it's a cosmetic problem with a carcass. So it's a cystic form of a tapeworm. Um, the tapeworm's got a big name called Tenia ovus and it lives in the dog. And then uh, eggs are ingested through grazing pasture by the sheep um, and the cystic form of the, of the parasite forms in muscle tissue, so the meat, the real, the meat tissue of, of the animal and results in a lot of loss of, of, of meat through trimming. And it's monitored through the works. It's very easy to see the parasite in the, in the carcass. And um, it causes, it can cause some major losses to the extent that there is a, a national program set up uh, um, under the management of of, um, of Ovis management. So, uh, and throughout the throughout the country, there are ebbs and flows of high incidence of the disease. So it is monitored, and I, I guess uh, you know we're trying to push the the rate of this this disease down so we can we can minimise the trade impact or the economic impact of the disease. It's unique to sheep? Yes, yeah, so it's cycled through sheep and dogs. So as I mentioned, the, the tapeworm's called Tenia ovis and the actual sheep measle itself, the little cyst, is called Cystocircus ovis. But because it looks like little white spots through the meat tissue, it, it, it's the, 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 the term has been coined sheep measles because it has those measle-like spots. Measle. Mm. So why the major concern? Yeah, mainly economic, um, but it's very easy to control. And I think um, as long as... Uh, Sheep farmers get abreast of the biology of the of the parasite. There's no reason why we can't minimise its 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 impact, and so there are a number of uh, number of ways that are important in the in the control mechanisms. Obviously, one of them is worming. Um, so the parasite has a pre-patent period. That is the period between the dog becoming infected by eating actually um, some sheep meat or offal that contains some cysts yep. um, and then the product of that infection which is eggs being produced and, and coming out the other end of the dog um, and that pre-patent period under ideal situations can be as little as 35 days and so um, it's good practice to look at stopping or halting that, that or killing those parasites within that pre-patent period and if we do that then of course there's never going to be any eggs output if we kill the parasite before that time mm. has elapsed before they can they can lay, they can distribute any eggs. So you work on the dog. Exactly. So that's one of the one of the mechanisms. Um, and so, really, just to make it easy, month a monthly worming would be you know would be the right way to go. And if you if you sustain that um, that worming frequency with a product such as Drontal or something that's going to kill those those tenia those tapeworm parasites. Um, then we're going to break the cycle and that's going to prevent the disease altogether. But of course I touched on it just before, the other component of, of this is actually dogs getting access to, to the sheep measle itself. And so that opens up, probably in my opinion, a bigger uh, and more important aspect rather than reliance on, on medication. And that is control of, of the dog getting access to the, to the cyst. Um, and so that means, you know, fallen stock need to be managed properly and, and put in dog safe areas, buried or in offal pits and that, this sort of thing. Any dog tuckers, the products or the meat from those dog tucker animals uh, that are going to be fed onto the dogs, they need to be prepared properly. So really either frozen for a good length of time, for 10 days minimum, um, before feeding, or, or rendered, so boiled or, or brought up to, to heat. Um, to deactivate the cyst before before any any of those products are fed, um, and of course you know we need to be aware of the uh, out of left field situations. So if you've got a property that uh, other other dog owners are accessing, hunters, for instance, we're in duck season at the moment, so we might have people that have ponds that they're allowing people to shoot on. 
um, any outside dogs that are coming in, they really need to be strictly policed and preferably you want to be able to be seeing that a vet has wormed those dogs and seen it to be done at the correct dose with the correct the correct drug before they've had access to your property. Um, the other thing that comes up, comes to mind is is grazing foreign stock. So if you've got store lambs coming onto your place or anything like that, you know you really want to be. Um, it would be good practice to ensure that whoever is grazing your land is practicing good good overs management as well. So good sheep measles management as well, and that way we're going to have a clear a clear property. There is a blood test, so if you start getting into trouble and you can't work out where the problem has come from, if you're getting reports back through from the works that you've got high incidence of sheep measles, uh, then you, your, your dogs can be tested and there's a simple blood test that will tell whether, that, whether the dog's infected or not. Now you mentioned dosing and you mentioned a vet. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to dose these things? No, very, very simple. But I guess the compliance thing, and if you're, <clears throat> it's very easy to assume that lay people um, are worming their dogs with the correct dose and, and the, the, the medication's going down the hatch, so to speak, and not being spat up, but sometimes that's just not the case. And I guess by bringing a veterinary surgeon into the picture and signing off or authorising that the, that, the, that the job's been done, you can guarantee those simple things are done. That, that one is the correct dose is used for the weight of the dog being treated, and secondly that the correct drug's being used, that is going to definitely kill that tapeworm because not all worming products are the same, and some worming products just won't kill the, the tapeworm itself. So once again it comes back to communication with your veterinarian, doesn't it? Absolutely. And there is very, very good information online um, through Avis Management, so I'd direct any sheep farmers to, to, that, to that source of, of information. Very, very good and very well managed. So bottom line, keep your, st keep your stock that have died well away from dogs. Exactly, and prepare dog tuckers correctly manage any foreign grazing sheep or dogs accessing your property that you can be sure that there that the, you know things have been done properly and really look um, seriously at, at strict monthly worming for your dog. Now, stock that comes onto your property that you may have bought mm -hmm. can you can you deal to them? Um, I guess that you can't really treat the sheep themselves um, but yeah if possible you want to really get a handle that that the property they've been sourced from has has been has been well managed as far as over just like a number of other normal infectious or viral diseases that we see in cattle and things very important to to kind of know the scenario on the source property if possible but if you're buying from the sale yards if you're buying from the sale yards yeah and you don't know that's obviously a risk and then you have to fall back on your your dog management so your feeding your fallen stock your regular worming this sort of thing and that that if, as long as that's done you're going to break the life cycle Nick, thank you very much you're indeed welcome. well as nick suggested that's duck shooting season and of course that debate about whether you use steel or whether you still use lead The lead versus steel, there's mm -hmm. a lot of people walked away when, when we had to use steel. Mm -hmm. Well it depends, I mean of course when you've, when, a lot of people don't like change but nowadays steel is, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of options out there which you, will, you, will, you can definitely still shoot and kill birds effectively with steel. It's finding the right combination between brand, ammunition, what your gun is, where you, what your choke should be. It's definitely still effective. Obviously lead is going to be more effective, it's heavier, it's more malleable, you will have more killing power, but you can find equivalent, if not, not, not so much equivalent, but a, a, very good, um, a very good second best in steel. So perhaps somebody should come in here with their shotgun and talk to the gunsmith? Yes, definitely. Or one of the salesmen here, we'll, we, can, we can definitely help you out with what choke you should use, what ammunition we recommend in steel. Um, there's many different brands and many different velocities and we'll, we'll, we'll find a right combination for you. Because that's one of the things that I found was mm. I thought, what choke do I use? And I didn't want it to go bump and, and not work or whatever. Well, there's so know. many different aspects of duck shooting and, and what you, you know, what, what ammo, what choke. There's five different chokes, there's six different sizes of, of duck ammunition. It's, 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 it can be quite confusing. As far as the guns, have they changed very much? You're obviously a, a Beretta <laughs> fan, but yes, Beretta, Benelli. I mean, I think what we find is that the same brands are, are, are kind of um, 
sprucing up their models. So the models over the last 20 years have been have been much the same. Now the Beretta A400 with the recoil reducing stock that's come out in probably the last five years. It's a really, really great gun. Um, your Benelli's, they've had a very, very similar gun over the last 20 years. Um, so the guns are still are still the same. You'd, we're dealing with two different types of operation, gas and inertia. And so we've got many different brands that fit within that. And tell me a bit more about this camouflage thing. Do <laughs> you, you, you turn up with those on the morning or do you set them up beforehand? Well, it depends. A lot of guys will build a, a standalone mime wire. You know, they've, they've spent their, the last month preparing with, with camo nets and everything. But we do have the blinds, which are so easy. You just set them up like a tent and they unfold instantly. And that's really handy if you've got quite a few people shooting in the same place and um, you want to spread out. Or because they're mobile, obviously, you can change your position during the day if you're finding where you are isn't working. So it's really handy. And especially for those people that don't have time to build their mime wire. You've got single chair and double chair and you've got quad blinds, so it's amazing the, um, the camo blinds that we have as well. And of course those decoys that I'm still chuckling about. <laughs> yes, the motion decoys, honestly, it's really worth it. I think once you give it a go and you see how well they work in the environment, you're blown away. You, what, you wouldn't shoot without one once you've used one. And the circling ducks? Yes, the circling ducks, they're my favourite. One year we set them out at the back of the Mai Mai because we didn't have room in the front of the Mai Mai. We were wondering why all the ducks were wanting to land at the back of the Mai Mai. They attract the ducks so well. They are so attracted to movement. So it's really well worth having a movement decoy. And one last shot for we who enjoy mm. duck shooting. It's not actually murder, it's actually culling. It is. I think, if, I mean, it's really amazing if you get into the conservation of duck shooting. You know, the ducks, they do, they can destroy the waterways, they can eat a lot of the feed that the farmers want to conserve. There's a whole lot of things um, that are benefits of, of duck shooting for our environment. And we, we, we do, we have an, an outrageous amount of numbers of ducks and we need to cull them. We're helping the environment. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Not sure how to brighten up your backyard? Try Grow Sure Easy Flowers. All in one mix. Seed, feed, mulch. It's bloomin' easy. Be sure with Grow Sure from KiwiCare. Dennis, soil tests. I guess it's that time of year. Well, it is, Rob. It's when things are a little bit quiet and, and you've got a little bit of time and... Uh, for, for the uh, agents to come and, and or yourself to, to sample your paddocks and uh, know and look up your records and say which ones uh, we've done and you know most farmers um, will test uh, their paddocks on a sort of a five year once every five year rotation to look after things like you know the pH levels liming and um, looking at other nutrients that might be missing phosphate um, the perhaps the potash and the nitrogen are more a fix-up thing in the spring like those elements are quite mobile uh, and quite um, susceptible to soil temperature in terms of uh, mineralization and things like that so um, they're perhaps a fix-up thing in the in the uh, in the spring but the the basic uh, foundation for the building or the foundation for the crop you know your pH and your your phosphate levels are something that can be fixed up and need to be fixed up perhaps um, up to six months before you really want it to um, be hitting its peak and working for you. There's a couple of wee things. Irrigation, for example, apparently locks up some things. Yeah, it locks up some things and actually leaches others. So there's a bit of a disparity. And there's all sorts of things like uh, things like sulphate of ammonia that you use as a nitrogen fertilizer are extremely acid. And so they can increase the demand or need for liming. Which, which is uh, you know alkaline and, and, and base and, and so the base and the alkaline what you use can affect how often you should be testing and, and putting um, things like lime on. Well you yeah. said five years but do you reckon you should do it more often than that? 
Depends how friendly your fertiliser company are. If, if they'll do those well, tests for nothing for you, if, if you're a good client or a big client, and, and uh, yeah, they normally do. They're pretty good, really. But because uh, you can yeah. you can over fertilise, can't you, with salt, with with phosphorus and milk, that sort of thing? Well, it, it it's it's basically a waste, and uh, I've seen it with lime. You know, guys will go out and put on um, seven ton per hectare. Well, it takes about um, a year to move your your um, your pH about. 0.1 with about one ton. So, if you want to put a whole lot of hundred-dollar notes out in the paddock there for a few years and just not have them work for you, if your cash flow is that good and you want to hide some money, <laughs> put on some capital fertilizer that's not working for you or not needed, basically. Yeah, I don't think too many of them out there would actually be ready to waste money. But no, so so it tends to be sort of um, yes, perhaps a little and often. And, and maybe that should flow into the soil testing as well. The other thing, Dennis, I guess, is, and, and you'll be aware of this, is that different crops have different demands. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, crops like radish, uh, huge um, potash requirements. Uh, things like wheat. Um, an English specialist said to us, he talked about fresh phosphate, and I thought this is a bit different because we have phosphate locked up in the soil, which can be released by the uh, addition of lime. Uh, to make it available, and I wouldn't call that fresh phosphate, that's probably old phosphate. It could be 70 years old, that phosphate. <laughs> well, it could be. It could have been locked up there for a long time. Um, but certainly this English specialist said, talked about fresh phosphate, and, and I listened to that intently, and with growing wheat, put on something like um, 300 kgs per hectare of, of superphosphate, and people have stopped using superphosphate because it's, it's, it's an old-fashioned actually two elements, a bit of bit of sulphur and a bit of phosphate in it. Um, it's not as sexy or exciting as uh, some of the blends that are used out there now, which have um, seen as a sort of a one-hit wonder, boof. But certainly, I, 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 I believe I saw a very good response to that super phosphate, which was relatively cheap per hectare, and I think we've forgotten about it. That's the old story. If you go back to what your grandfather did. I mean, cleaning windows with vinegar or with methylated spirits rather than some fancy, expensive stuff. <laughs> Same yep. sort of thing. Well, the old boys used to drill their wheat with um, 100 weight of superphosphate per acre. Now, that's the old terminology, but 100 weight per acre, which 100 weight is roughly 50 kilos. So that's about 250 um, kgs per hectare. And they did all right. They did well. Indeed. You've talked about malting barley and demand and people not so good. How, where are we at? Well, things have changed. You know, we're all drinking more wine and less beer, although there's a movement for the craft beers. People there coming is back. A very really strong one. Very strong movement. And so gradually the mainstream um, production of beer and the consumption of beer have gone back and wine's gone up, we all know that. So the beer consumption's gone down to a very low base and uh, some surpluses now have been cleared out and so the prospects for the requirements for malting barley are on the up and up and the forecast is for something like about a 14% increase. So I know one company, Malt Europe, have cleaned out their surpluses so they'll be looking for um, greater supplies and, and other people, the craft beer people, they're uh, getting in on the act so it's on the up and up and let's just hope the price is on the up and up because it needs to be because it is quite a specialist crop to grow. It's not like growing feed barley, quite different. What it is, you've got to have your proteins down and all that sort of thing for that sort of carry on. Absolutely and, and historically those um, malting varieties that are suitable for malting have been a little bit behind in the, um, in the yield stakes as well. New plantings, now they're pretty susceptible. Yes, well we're looking at uh, new plantings of um, your, your hedgerows and shelter belts and things like that and let's face it with the, uh, with the centre pivots and so forth, um, the, the guys have been clearing out trees and, and the Canterbury Plains are almost like, uh, where's the next tree? You can't see it. <laughs> but quite a few farmers are actually uh, planting some lower growing hedges just to, to break that uh, a little bit of shelter for stock and, and to break some of that wind and so forth and of course we know the centre pivots can just go over the top but this time of year grass weeds especially grass weeds um, you can put on some residual herbicides that will keep that area 
clear around the base of those um, those plants and give them a fair old go because you pay big money for uh, ornamental plantings or even native plantings. Yeah. You're big into radish. What are some of the, the pitfalls with disease in mind? Well, one of the challenges, Rob, is, is um, seasonal fluctuations and, and, and uh, we do things like fertilise radish, we irrigate radish and sometimes we cause some problems and we, with, with, with moisture, things like downy mildew, things like uh, bacterial soft rot, um, things like alternaria, those sorts of diseases can be exacerbated by too much water. We can also be uh, affecting the bees because bees do not operate on wet days or when the crop is wet and so if you keep using things like centre pivots and you're going back there with a little bit of water but you're, you're keeping that crop wet and keeping the bees out of it and so it, it appears as if less water um, but no lo less frequent irrigation but higher volumes when you do might be helping the bees but white rust white blister rust is a major and there's some very good work being done by far uh, on that and you might hear some of that in the future. Yes, thank you very much indeed. It's interesting what sort of businesses you find in the middle of nowhere. We find an interesting one which you better have a look at in just a moment. I must confess that driving around Christchurch I see a lot of very small children on scooters heading off to school or heading off to wherever they're heading off to but I had no idea that scooters is actually an international sport. Chris, how big is it in the world? Uh, it's, it's still a small sport, um, but it's a growing sport. And so with the arrival of scooter riders into the likes of X Games, into Nitro Circus, has made a big difference into Talking that sport. Talking a language to me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and to the extent that there is now a scooter world competition. So there's an international scooter association and every year in Barcelona they run a world competition. Um, now the one that I see the children riding on to school yep. are not the ones that you're using for sport. They're not the ones that you're using for sport but they're not a lot different. Um, so they're a lot cheaper um, and they're not quite as robust. You don't want to do a backflip on one of those. Um, and at that world competition you'll see lots of backflips and front flips and double backflips and lots of other stuff. So okay, a very obvious question. You have a business cutting Timothy Chaff, you're yeah. an ex-mushroom grower <laughs> and now you're the manufacturer <laughs> in the middle of nowhere of competition scooters. Yeah, so we got into this because I have two boys that uh, were heavily into scootering. Uh, and we couldn't find the parts that we wanted uh, for their scooters uh, here in New Zealand. And so we looked around and said, well, we were buying stuff out of Australia in most cases. And I looked at that and thought, that's just a bit stupid. Um, there's got to be someone in New Zealand that can do this. The sport's obviously growing. There's more and more interest in it. And so we looked around and said, well, why don't we start our own? And uh, so one thing led to another. We actually bought an existing business uh, that was the lady that had finished with, and uh, we went from there. It's the Kiwi way. It's the Kiwi way. And uh, yeah, we're now one of the leading, we're probably the leading uh, retailer of scooter parts in the country, particularly in terms of specialist scooter parts. Um, so we do the serious stuff. Um, so we can do custom builds. Uh, we sponsor New Zealand's best and second best riders. Uh, they buy the, all their parts through us um, for their scooters. So are you manufacturing these bits? So we don't manufacture them. We buy them in um, from the leading brands across the world. Uh, so we stock Apex, which is the leading park brand. Um, but we also bring stuff out of um, America. We do the Youth Gone Wild, which are becoming really popular. Uh, we do a lot of Envy products. Um, all of the leading brands we've pretty much got. Now you said internationally, is there an international competition? Yes there is. So New Zealand fits in as part of the Australasian competition. So we sit as part of that. The winner of the New Zealand competition, which was held in January this year at Washington Skate Park, the winner of that competition gets automatic entry into the world competition in Barcelona in 
June or July this year. Um, and then the, the five other top places get a chance to compete in Australia. Um, and the top five out of Australia then get to, to go to the Worlds as well. <laughs> so we'll be looking at it as an Olympic sport in about 15 years I suppose. Well skateboarding's just been accepted into as an exhibition sport into the Olympics. Uh, I think it's the next Olympics um, and there's no reason why scootering couldn't be there. The, the only thing that's stopping scootering I think is the fact that it's just a new sport. Um, you know if you go back probably 10 years ago Scootering was for the kids that couldn't ride a skateboard um, because we couldn't balance on it. And I was one of those kids, I could never get them balance right. Um, nowadays, when you go to the skate park, there's probably more kids riding scooters than there are skateboards. And when you look at the range of tricks that you can do on a scooter uh, versus a skateboard, the range is far, far greater. Uh, I have yet to see too many people doing backflips on skateboards. I guess for my age group, it's like skiers suddenly having to accept snowboarders. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's exactly the same thing, and it's probably the same with water skiers and wakeboarders. Um, it's just that, that evolution of what you can now do and, and where those sports are going. So you can run a business like this in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, so we, uh, we do a lot of our business through the web, uh, but we also have a mobile shop. Uh, which we take into Christchurch uh, every weekend. So Saturdays and Sundays, uh, we're in Washington Way. Um, and yeah, we do a lot of business through there. The Kiwi marketing. The Kiwi marketing. <laughs> um, and it, uh, you know, I guess that for us, because we're, we're a, a niche ma retailer, um, we had to and look wholesaler. at and, and wholesaler. We, we had to find different ways of doing it. Um, and the traditional bricks and mortar shop doesn't work. Um, most of our retail business is done on a Saturday and Sunday. If we had a retail shop Monday to Friday, it would be empty um, of customers. So um, social media, Chris, is basically your main marketing tool. So social media is our <clears throat> pretty much our main marketing tool. Um, and that's why we sponsor New Zealand's leading writers, um, because they have a big social media following. And it's Scooter Bits. Um, it's Scooter Bits, B-I-T-Z on the end. Um, and we also work with, um, so New Zealand has one of the biggest YouTube uh, scooter channels um, in the country, and it's based here in Christchurch. Um, and so we work with Scooter Brad uh, in terms of just growing the entire sport um, of scootering across the country. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try GrowSure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with GrowSure from KiwiCare. Tony, land use consents a huge minefield. Uh, yes, they are if you don't get them done. That's the minefield. Uh, Originally, um, in, the, in the plan, in the Land and Water Plan in Canterbury, there was a requirement to have your land use consent in place to carry on farming on the 31st of January 2017. Well, that was never going to happen. And which planner thought that was a great idea, I don't know. But now it appears like uh, that they need to be done this year. So that's sort of a, you know, how long is a piece of rope? Um, but uh, put it this way, it's it's... It's, it's given everybody the opportunity to get their land use consent where they're required in place by the end of this year. That means uh, people need to have their farm environmental plan up to date. They need to have done their overseer baseline and they probably need to have run their 
2016-17 uh, overseer results to see how they match up against their, their baseline. So get those things in place, land use consent straightforward from that point on. Um, you've, you've done all the hard work, if that's the, if that's, if that's the word, all your record keeping's in place, you've, you've got any soil moisture information in place, you've got your water meter stuff in place, you've got your nutrients in place. Uh, so then the land use consent becomes um, sort of a formality. Uh, if that's the right word, I don't think there's ever a formality when you when you get to doing resource consents, but at least you've ticked the big boxes that have to be ticked, uh, and it means that you you know you'll you'll get everything tidied up. They, uh, you know, we're we're all over the over the world, in fact, and also in in New Zealand, uh, we're heading down a a much greater regulatory path. Uh, you know, get all your ducks in a row, and you can carry on doing what you're doing. Don't get your ducks in a row. Then, then you've got a few things that are, you know, you'll curse and swear and carry on about this, but get your ducks in a row and it's okay. You know, I was just talking to someone, actually while I was in Melbourne 10 days ago, uh, about the environment in Scotland. And he said, besides the fact, why the hell would you want to farm in Scotland, uh, was his comment. But he said, if we think our regulatory requirements to farm here are tough, go try farming in, in parts of the in parts of the European community, for example, the regulations that are required uh, are much, much greater than what we have to deal with here. You know, um, get on with it, get it done, and then get on with what you're, what you're doing really well. So, you know, just a, you know, just a word of warning, uh, and get 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 the process underway and get this land use consent in place so that you can carry on doing what you love doing. What happens if you don't? Um, well, if you don't, then then um, uh, then then you're, you're going to you become a basically a prohibited activity. Now, the best example of that is is consents that are coming up for renewal. So, if you go back 10, 10 or twelve years, when a lot of the groundwater hearings took place, and when some of the reviews took place of of uh, groundwater zones, uh, we moved from getting consents granted for 35 years to them being granted for 10. So a lot of those consents are coming up for renewal. Uh, well, in fact, a lot of them have come up for renewal in 2017, June 30th, 2017. <clears throat> so the plan works like this. If you make your application within six months of June the 30th, then you can carry on farming, carry on taking water, in this case taking water, but it will apply to the land use consent as well. You can carry on doing what you're doing under a, under a section 124 in the, in the Resource Management Act until you get your application sorted out with, uh, in this case, Environment Cannery, but it could be Hawke's Bay Regional Council, it could be Otago Regional Council, it could be any one of the regional councils. That's fine. However, if you do not get it in within three months of the expiry date, then as soon as that three-month period arrives, then that, it, the day after that it becomes in parts of Canterbury in particular, it becomes a prohibited activity. In other words, you can't even apply to renew your consent. Yes, for water you're talking now. For water, but it will it applies to all consents. This applies to all your consents. So if you so, have a discharge consent, for example, for uh, um, spray irrigating uh, wastewater, effluent wastewater from a piggery or a chicken farm or dairy shed or whatever it happens to be, and you make that application six months prior to the expiry date, carry on doing what you're doing until you sort out the, any issues with the consent. Go a day after the three month period, this is the way the plan in Canterbury is written, it becomes a prohibited activity. So you lock so the you gate? Lock the gate. So we've had a couple of uh, farmers that have, in recent times, that have uh, called us that, and I think I might have talked about one of them before, but another one has arisen where we're inside the three month period and um, you know the letters piled up Bills were paid, mail just got piled up. A couple of wet days, I'm going to clear the mail. Oh dear, um, I've just got a letter to say that uh, you know my three month period is up and that now um, I'm in the prohibited activity category. Uh, what do I do? So you get on the phone, let me see if we can talk to Environment Canterbury. We have done that and on a couple of occasions we've been able to get that uh, that prohibited activity relaxed. Uh, that's unlikely to happen now. It's now basically the beginning of June. 
So if your consent expires at the end of June, I suspect that they will take a less than tolerant attitude and that, that will be a prohibited activity. So we can't even get a consent application through the door under those circumstances. I and mean, they won't even receipt it, basically. Tony, I really want to hammer home that for your land use consent, if you think it's too hard, don't do it, that you're going to have to lock the gate and you can't farm. Yep, get it done. Look, the, if you've done all those other things, the land use consent's not very expensive to deal with at all. Um, there's people who will help you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's consultancies out there. You know, we're one of them, but there's, there's other consultancies out there that are dealing with this thing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so long as you've done those other things that I talked about, your uh, overseer report, you know, that takes care of all your fertiliser and nutrients that you're introducing, irrigation, all those sorts of things. So you've got that farm environmental plan in place, then, you know, your land use consents the least of your worries. I'm worried about the person who hasn't mm -hmm. kept those records, that they can't remember what they put on Paddock X yep. five years ago. Yeah, well, um, that's, that's a real problem because then you're in the dream up world. Um, you know, you know that you had three tonnes of urea delivered, but you have no record of when you put it on and or where you, you put, put it, it on. on. Um, it's, this is all about, you know, proof of placement. Um, and it's so what this, do you do if you can't remember and uh, you don't have a record? You just have to make a record up, basically, to, to know that you actually used three tonnes. Let's just spread it out. You know, what did you do? 60 units here, 60 units there. Um, and that's the best you can do. Yep. So it makes a, it sort of makes a little mockery of the, of the baseline that you have to do, but that's the best we can do. And then you can move forward from that point and see whether or not you are, you know, doing better or not. Look, the, the large majority, um, maybe 50%, 60% of farmers, they have, they have a pretty good record. And if they don't have a pretty good record, then you can go to the fertiliser company, you can go to Balance or, or uh, Ravensdown and find out how much you actually purchased and when you purchased it. Uh, unless you're spreading your own, um, those that are spreading their own have got proof of placement. They know where they put it, when they put it. Uh, you know, they're, they're the It'll be in operators. their diary. It'll be it? in their diary or <laughs> else these days, Probably for, for a lot of farmers for the last four or five years, it will be recorded on their on their um, on their GPS system where they put it and when they put it on yeah. there and which runs they put it on and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you've got a contractor that did it, they will have a record of when they came to your property and what they spread. And it might not be exactly precise, but at least it's a starting point. And and this is about in a way it's about the starting point, making sure that everybody keeps really good records of what they do and when they did it. Tony, thank you very much indeed. Just a moment or two, we're going to be talking to Chloe Tipple again, but not about duck shooting, but about her career as a professional sports person. <music> Chloe, just back from overseas representing New Zealand at trap shooting. Yes, that's correct. Skeet shooting. Skeet shooting. Skeet shooting. What's yeah. the difference? So trap was a clay, they're both clay target shooting, but trap goes away from you, skeet crosses from you. So. Six and one half doesn't be the other. They're, they're both the same thing, but <laughs> different. How big is it as a sport as far around the world? Around the world, it's huge. It's really, really big. I mean, you go to a World Cup, and in my event, I'm competing against 60 to 70 different women. Um, there's there's a 150 men competing in the same event. So the World Cups and the World Championships is a, is a very, very big event. It's huge. So how did you get into it? I mean, obviously, Dad's got a gun shop. <laughs> well, I got into down-the-line shooting or claybird shooting when I was at high school here, and I kind of got as far as I could go, and the Commonwealth Games was always a dream, or the Olympics was always a dream, but I had to change discipline in order to go. So that's pretty much how I got into it. After, um, after reaching as far as I could go within New Zealand, I went to the next level and went to the Olympic disciplines. Why is it not big in New Zealand? It seems to be very low key. In Europe and overseas, they generally start on the Olympic disciplines. Here in New Zealand, we start on down the line or American skeet, which is more, I would say, the American disciplines. So slightly easier, slightly slower targets. Um, it's it's just how we've done it from the beginning. So I guess because they've the Europeans have done it, the Olympic disciplines from the beginning, that's what we know. So it's a lot harder to get into the Olympic disciplines because generally the clay targets are faster, so it's a, it's a harder discipline to get into. And a lot of shooters, when they try it, can get discouraged, or because there's not a lot of competitions that are Olympic discipline within New Zealand, it's just there's there's no interest because it's not, it's not as big. It's just not as big. Well, you're in the top numbers <laughs> around the world. What's your secret to hitting either a bird or, or a clay bird? 
keep the gun moving. <laughs> um, driving the barrel, it's, it's honestly all about being the same speed as your target. If you can get your barrel moving the same speed as the target, generally you're on the right track. A lot of people have difficulty, they'll stop their gun or they'll do lots of different things, but my secret I suppose is, is the relation between my barrel and the target is always the same. People should go to a gun club and learn from those that are good at it. I believe so. I think it's really helpful. Everybody will learn something different. I mean, of course, you're going to hear so many different disciplines about what gun you should use or, or what ammunition you should use or this is how you should shoot, this is how, this is what you should do. But I think if you expose yourself to many different types or many different opinions, then you'll obviously form your own opinion. And it's experience. If you get out there and do it yourself, if you go and learn from somebody else who's done it for 40 years, you're going to get all kinds of different opinions and it'll help you learn. So it's mileage. Yeah, definitely, absolutely, for sure. What's your favourite gun? My favourite gun, well, in semi-automatic shotguns, which I'll use for clay target shooting, uh, sorry, for duck, for duck season, I'll use a Beretta A400, um, and they're an amazing gun. Got a kick-off recoil reducing system, really beautiful to shoot. You can shoot all day and not know you've pulled the trigger. They're an incredible gun. And for competition? <coughs> For competition, I use a Beretta DT11, so it's their top range, um, it's their top range competition gun. It's just a stunning gun to use, and I've got a nice custom wooden stock on there, so it's all set up for me. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges, challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Fake news and alternative facts. I mean, the birds that have been bantered around yeah, have yep. suddenly come into our into our dictionaries. Yeah. And well, I, I think that, that that we can, you know, sort of. There's a there's a trivial interpretation of it. It's fake. It's fake because if it's fake, I don't have to deal with it. So so you take a view. You might say, you know, um, whatever I've got to say on any particular matter is it's fake. It's, you're just you're just making it up. So you don't have to deal with it, you just dismiss it. So we have this objective reality, uh, gravity, the wind blows, the sun shines. You know, you can say the, the sun's fake, but you'll still get the sunburn. Um, or you can have the subjective reality, which is, I actually just don't believe that X is the case, so I can just reject it. This sort of sounds like global warming to me. Well, I, I, that, that's, 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 we'll get on, maybe get onto it a bit later, but global warming's sort of, the, the, the easy thing to call fake is the causal relationship. So, so we'll say it isn't people, it isn't burning hydrocarbons, it isn't CO2 that's creating global warming. So we don't have to do anything about it because we aren't connected to why it's happening. It's just happening and there's nothing we can do about it. So you can dismiss a lot of the science by attacking the causal problem. So this happens and causes this to happen. No, 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 that's all fake. Don't let's worry about that. A sad thing is, and we'll talk about him shortly, no doubt, but it's, this has all come about at about the same time as Trump's arrival. Well, that's, that's the sort of... Uh, the way that Trump used social media. So we've now got these Twitter bots and, and bots on Facebook that talk to people of certain profiles who, who are feeling probably very legitimately hard done to. You're in Midwest, small town America, the factory that kept the, sound, the town alive has closed, it's no longer there. The promise of the world for the people there is sort of crumbling. The house or the property they've got becomes worth less because there's no call for the jobs. You know, there's, there's, there's echoes of this around New Zealand, and particularly rural New Zealand. And so, so it's easy to say to those people, things are bad because of, you know, the Chinese took our jobs. Well, maybe 
might be a different way that the owners of the companies chased the lowest uh, production price and went to China. The Chinese didn't steal anything. It's back to that causal. What caused it to happen? What was the driver behind that? So you can get angry at the Chinese, but you're not getting angry at the probably the, the right people to focus on. OK, post-truth. Well, that's the... We are now having, it's fake news, the argument, why, why do you want to investigate Russian ties? There aren't any. So why do, you want to, why, why do you want to investigate it? So Mr. Comey, you know, let Mr. Flynn off. Oh, maybe not. Okay, well, we'll just fire you. Because, again, that issue is I don't think there's a problem, so there isn't a problem. And for the people who are in that echo chamber, they see the comment that there isn't a problem as almost an act of faith. You know, we think about religion. On this side of an act of faith, you're looking for objective evidence for religion. On the other side of an active faith, you don't need objective evidence because you've gone through that, that transition. And for a lot of some groups in politics, we've gone through the act of faith. So whatever an individual says is what really is the fact. And so Trump says, fake news. Trump talks about complete rubbish. And for some people, it's true. But then you go, we've got a, a worry about terrorism. Terrorists are Muslims. Therefore, all Muslims are terrorists. Therefore, ban the Muslims. That sort of logic process drives people to the post-truth world, which is when I distort reality enough, it becomes a new reality. This is Hitler and the Jews. It could well be. I mean, that's a, another extreme version of we have a problem, that particular group is the problem, now we have to deal with that particular group, and the excesses get greater and greater and greater. And remember with Hitler, the early part of the 30s, it was all happening and people were saying, oh, it won't be that bad, it's not really that bad. A lot of the echoes are what we hear around our friend Trump. Mm. Winston Churchill just fell on deaf ears. He mm -hmm. said it's going to be a That's problem. Right. No one would. No one uh, he was, he was uh, not alone, but he was in the mi minority for a long time pointing to the problem. Mm. So rumours, and this is a sort of the scuttlebuck, you know, that, that, that so-and-so is doing this or doing that, and all of a sudden it becomes... Oh, the, 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 um, the guy shows up with a gun at a pizza parlor somewhere on the, west, on the east coast because it's in the rumour mill that Hillary Clinton's running a child pornography group out of this pizza place. And it's, it's, it is that... that on the distribution, there are some people that will literally believe almost anything. And people who've half heard what you've just said will go, really? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> but but that, 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 that sort of difficulty becomes now we are taking away the common basis for arguments. So, so if you or I, and I are having an argument about politics or something, there has to be a foundation between us in order to have a sensible discussion. Otherwise, it degenerates to the five-year-olds <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the playground. Will, won't. Yes, no. It becomes a, an argument of, of position rather than, well, we can agree on this. Yes, yes, OK. So can we agree on this? No, we can't. Well, let's we'll take that apart and talk a little bit more about that. Now, if we think about that, that's the democratic process. Are we at risk of losing our democracy? That's what is fundamentally threatened in this sort of fake news post-truth era. If we can't agree to have a sensible argument one step at a time and all we do is polarise, then th there, is, there is no democratic discussion possible. So we, where does science and technology come into all this? Well, that, that's now where the, the sort of rubber hits the road. We can argue about politics, right and left of politics. We can argue about economics and causal relationships. But science is, is the place where objective reality must matter. Because if we say 
this happens causing climate change in this way, if we understand the causal relationships, we can start to change behaviors and change what we do in order to put things right. But if we don't understand the relationships, well, we don't, or, or, or completely reject the relationships, we don't have to do anything and we can turn on the Keystone Pipeline, we can drill more oil, we can run bigger, we can do all those things which you might do differently if you recognize that doing this leads to climate change. Climate change is a problem for a lot of people, including a lot of Americans, and it will need to be dealt with sooner rather than later. It's the old asteroid problem. If you give it a push when it's a long way out, you don't have to push it really hard when it's just about to collapse into the planet. Very briefly, how do you get around the fact that some people love Holdens and some people love Fords and you'll never get them to drive either? And that's you know fine. I mean? And that, at, at, at one level, not, not a worry. You take your view, but the people who show no particular bias towards Holden or to Ford can make a legitimate, balanced s decision. Yep. What you can't do is, is apply that polarization to everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Now, if you'd like to recap on what John's just been saying, you can go to our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Coke Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.